photo the next thing approved. Yeah. Yeah, as you said, it did account for the expense of. Um, there is matters arising out of the minutes, which is forwarded forward in the form of a PowerPoint uh, to all the members of the committee. Um, and at the last minute, there were a couple of questions that Grant Thornton came out of the minutes, which we've had a reply to. So if you go to the PowerPoint that's been sent out um, to all the committee members by Mrs. Bacco, uh, um, you will see on page number three of the PowerPoint, you will see the questions that we put to Grant Thornton in regards to the increase in the fees that they are charging us. And you will also see the response that we have had from Grant Thornton as well. Now, I believe this was circulated to members in the form of an email um, earlier on uh, by Mrs. Buck. So you've had an opportunity to have a look at this and read through it. Would you like to just uh, talk about that, Mrs. Buck, or would you like to mention it? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, so the, there were two questions which came from the last audit committee meeting. Um, and that's when Grant Thornton presented their uh, audit plan for this financial year. And so in their audit plan, they did highlight that there would be a 27% increase in audit fees. Um, and the question from this committee was that uh, the committee reiterated its previously held view that a 27% increase in audit fees was excessive. Um, and would the council receive 27% extra auditor hours on the audit to reflect the increased fee um, and the response which has come back from Grant Thornton has, has basically said that whilst the audit fee does not cover a set number of days or hours um, as an internal audit contract would it instead covers the cost of delivering the external audit as a whole um, therefore the increase in costs arise directly as a result of increased time that is required to complete their external audit um, they do go on to say that audits are taking significantly longer to deliver to the required quality standard for a number of reasons um, and they've said that this can be seen quite clearly in the number of audit opinions which were issued by audit firms um, by the target date for last year which was actually the 30th November 2020 um, and, and you can see there in, in the chart that Grant Thornton has given us that actually for the 1920 accounts only 45% um, of audit opinions were actually given by the deadline. Um, now ours would obviously be included within that 45% because ours was achieved within the deadline. Um, but you can see the trend, which is um, a deteriorating one from the position that all authorities nationally were in in 2016-17, when 95% of audit opinions were delivered by the audit target date of 30th of September. So even though it's a, a later date that the audit opinion has to be given by, you, you can see the, the difficulties that um, are, are being, um, are being uh, experienced. Um, and obviously the, the deadline for this year is the 30th of September. We have got our audit committee meeting as late as possible. We, the, um, I think my advice was let, let's have the meeting on the, the very last day to have the maximum opportunity of, of achieving our audit opinion within the deadline. So um, thank you to members for accommodating that meeting on the 30th of September. Um, and where we are at the moment, we are obviously uh, Grant Thornton are, are been in auditing the accounts for a good few weeks now. Um, we're a good way through that, um, but obviously there, there is still a way to go. We've got another best part of the month really until the 30th of September deadline. What it might mean, it may mean that um, in terms of publishing the accounts sort of, you know, seven, uh, seven working days before the actual meeting, some of those reports from Grant Thornton may come as to follow. So we may not get there. Um, uh, audit um, opinion um, on the day of publication of, of the agenda. It may come as a to follow document, but it would be obviously before the 30th of September. Councillor Taylor. Yeah, um, I have I, I, I two points really. I'm a bit concerned that um, why should we be advised for other people putting their returns in? Because that's come across from you now. Um, and the other is, 
why every year, I mean, I've only been on it for two and a half years, but every year it seems to get pumped up at the end of the year. You know, you start off with 45,000, we end up paying 52. Yeah. And, and that, that, so these figures don't mean much if you see where it comes from. They're quotes. No, yeah. They don't mean much. It's open ended. And, and that, that does work out. Yeah, I mean, I think in this, the two areas where the auditors are, are definitely doing more work than in previous years are around fixed assets and in particular around valuations um, and also on pensions. Now, both of those are areas that even if, if there is an increase in our pension liability or if fixed asset valuations go up or go down, that doesn't affect the bottom line of our income and expenditure account um, because we are... Um, we're not a private practice, um, so therefore they're doing the same amount of work as they would do for a company in the private sector. Um, this is a point that all councils nationally made um, to Sir Tony Redmond when he completed the Redmond review, and we did say surely the amount of work that can be done on fixed, fixed assets and pensions could be scaled back because it doesn't have a direct impact on the bottom line of the council. Um, because it all just gets reversed out. Um, unfortunately, um, the conclusion of the, of the Redmond review was was not to scale back area, the work in those two areas. So I think we are still going to have um, additional work in those areas. Um, and, and that is part of the reason that the audits take longer um, because there's a lot of complex queries around those. Um, and also it does, does mean that audit fees are increased as well. Um, but what you're saying is that when they quote, do they not know this is going to happen? Well, that, that, that is our challenge back to the auditors because, as you say, I, I ha a couple of years ago, it was the case that, that, that extra work was coming out um, or they were having to do extra work that perhaps they wouldn't have foreseen. But this has been the case for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, it should be included in the scale fee that, that we pay. Um, I mean, the. The government have given, um, we will get a bit of a refund, so we'll probably get somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 of our additional audit fees back um, because the government put £15 million in as a one-off to compensate councils for extra audit fees. Um, so it, it, it's not just our council, um, this, this is the case for, for councils nationally. And the government have recognised that and have given £15 million in compensation across all of the councils. Um, and our share of that will be somewhere between 15 and, and 20000 So we will get some of that back, but it, it, we will still have to increase all these fees going forward. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Spencer. Thank you. Um, I, I I'm just reading Grant Thornton's response. Am I right in saying? that they have achieved a reducing percentage of um, their audit targets, meeting the deadline. So this is their performance, this is their measuring. But let's say it's 95 down to 45. Yeah, no, this will be nationally. So this will be all the audit firms, um, of which Grant Thornton are one. And, the biggest, I think. Um, yes, one of the biggest. There are some other big firms yeah. as well. Um, yes, but um, yeah, it, well, when a couple of years ago when the um, audits were uh, tendered for, yes, you're right, Grant Thornton were one of the biggest, or yeah. were certainly awarded one of the biggest lots of, of the work, yes. I just mentioned that in the sense that when you look at the question, um, the, the implication of the question is it's, it, it's the increase which is excessive. They haven't actually addressed that, I don't think. They've addressed the question, you know, would the council receive 27 extra audit hours? Um, they've answered that bit, but I just I'm still seriously concerned that there's a 27 percent increase last year for a significant drop in efficiency from the organisation that's monitoring our accounts. Mm -hmm. um, and the last uh, statement on their response says that the PSA ultimately will determine the appropriateness of these fees, which I think is you know as good an example of slippery soldiers as I could possibly come up with. Um, I still don't think they're being accountable, um, but I might be the only one who thinks that. Yeah, uh, I mean, there, there will be an opportunity in a couple of years' time, um, again, for the audit committee to consider what it does around its audit firm provider, 
So as we did a couple of years ago, we would have a choice as to whether we go into the national tendering framework or whether we as ourselves come up with um, like an auditor panel um, and we go out and ask for quotes from firms. Um, th there will be a very limited number of firms that have the knowledge and experience of local government accounting that we could approach. Um, it is quite a specialised area um, and I think that's probably why there are limited companies that do tender for that audit work nationally. I'm a little concerned you're saying we're now potentially looking at missing the deadline on the 30th. Um, no, we're, we're, we're hoping to meet that. We're certainly hoping to meet that deadline. Um, there, there is always the possibility that we can't meet that deadline. Um, and, and that won't be anything that the council has done. Um, obviously, that they are um, doing their audit work and we are responding to queries as fast as, as we can. Um, but there is always that um, you know we can't we can't guarantee that until we get nearer nearer the date and we can see the areas that are being signed off. So on a daily basis we do get um, a document from Grant Thompson saying where we are with different audit queries. So it will look at different sections like fixed assets, for example, or the collection fund, and it will say yes, this area is signed off. Um, at the moment there are still quite a lot of areas that are work in progress. Um, but yes, we are we are very much intending to meet meet that deadline of 30th September. And um, members may be interested, but Mark Ponce and Armour are attending on the 30th of September. Aren't yes, they? they are. Yes, they do send their apologies for today's meeting, but yes, they will definitely be here. So if you have questions, you can actually ask them directly on the at the end of the month. Yes, that's right, Chairman. Thank Any you. other questions regarding Mark Ponce at this stage for members? Oh, urgent business. I have no urgent business brought forward. Division of the agenda, there will not be any need to divide the agenda with the documents from the public sphere. Declaration of interest, members are invited to declare any public, small or disclosable pecuniary interest they may have, including the nature and extent of such interest, any terms to be considered at this meeting. Do any members declare an interest? No. Uh, so we move on to the main issue. Um, before, before we come to agenda item number five, there was a question prior to we started in the raised by Councillor Kay, where you were saying, do we need to meet in person uh, for all of it? Um, and could this not have been done remotely? Is that correct? That, that was a bit of what I was asking, yeah. Yeah. Um, Mr. White, would you like to, to just address that? Yeah, uh, through you. As a formal meeting, it is required of the audit committee to review and scrutinise the statement of accounts in, in a public setting or a public meeting. And as the, the regulations do not permit for a, a hybrid, if you like, for remote meetings, it is a requirement for voting committee members to be in the room, take part in the vote on it, and then it on. We have no interest in that. I would all be for remote meetings wherever we possibly can, unfortunately we can't. So moving to agenda item number five, uh, we have Councillor Batson here who's presenting the draft statement of the Council Draft Annual Governance as he's the executive member responsible for that. So I'll hand over to Councillor Batson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll speak back here, actually. Uh, members, uh, the report recommends that members note the draft statements of account and draft annual government statement for the financial year and in 31st of March 2021. The report reminds us that the statement of accounts, statement of accounts is an essential feature of public accountability and provides a stewardship, stewardship report on the use of funds raised from the public. The closing of the accounts is also important to the budgetary process since it confirms the availability of reserves and balances for future years. The underspent on the general fund in 2020-21 of £112,000 has been transferred to the general fund balance and earmark revenue reserve. The level of this reserve now stands at 2.12 million at the 31st of March 2021. Section 3 of the report sets out the capital expenditure in 2020 -21, which has included 1.6 million on waste vehicles for the implementation of the Delano Line service. 
one point two million on waste at on the waste at work Island Bridge and one point one million on the residential renovation grant, including disabled facilities grant. Section four of the report sets out the impact of COVID nineteen on the valuation of council's property, equipment and investment properties. Valuations are reported based on material valuation uncertainty. This is a national issue and is likely to affect all councils. Values in the 2021 uh, statement of accounts have been based on the situation prior to COVID-19 uh, COVID on the assumption that values will be restored when the real estate market becomes more fluid. Turning now to the annual government statement, which is at Appendix B, this confirms that the Council has carried out a self-assessment of the extent of which it complies with seven core principles of good government. The accounts are in the process of being audited, and the audited accounts at Thornton's audit report of the, on the account will be presented at the audit committee meeting on the 30th of September. Grant Thornton will also assess the arrangements the council has in place for improve, improving the economy, efficiency and effectiveness, financial stability and government. Thank you, Jim. Councillor Bassett. Um, do members have any questions for Councillor Bassett before we move on to the general discussion about draft reports? Please. Um, yes, Councillor, you, you did mention about vehicle budget. Um, now, is that prior to this new addition to the vehicles, is it? And that came out of the first first purchase, and some of that money was put aside for renewal of vehicles anyway, was it not? Yeah, so that's for the vehicles we bought prior to the 31st of March. Yeah, so, so the ones that are um, that we in this case. Yeah, yeah, okay. I believe Councillor Spence has a few questions you'd like to put to Yes, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I'd like to pick up on staying with, with, with FCC and not wishing to dwell on their performances. Um, I had an understanding or a, a feeling in my mind's eye that um, penalties um, were or are being or have been imposed on FCC for failures to meet their contract terms. Um, and I seem to, seem, seem to remember Stigma when you were talking about. Um, some of those penalties being in the first quarter of this year. Um, and I, I didn't find any reference to that in the in the evidence, at least as far as I could see. And so that was my question. And the second was, um, bearing in mind some of the comments made by Councillor Birch in his email, um, and in particular his second question, um, I had assumed that the additional spend on salaries that we've had to incur uh, uh, as a result of FCC um, uh, were going to be funded by FCC or allocated to FCC, and I didn't see any provision for that. So uh, uh, um, well, that's really where I'm coming from. The straight answer is that the accounts for considering today are for the year ended 31st March 2021. The difficulties for FCC didn't occur until after that. And, I, and uh, Mrs. Buckle was nodding her head. So I, I, I make particular reference to a um, meeting, which I can't remember whether it was audit or OES, where I'm sure Steve said something about um, uh, 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 penalties, for want of a better word, being imposed for the first quarter of this calendar year. I know it would have been for the first quarter. Of this financial year. Okay. Uh, no, I, I can answer that, Chairman. Um, so, yes, during 2020 2021, um, so if, if, I, if I break that, the current year that we're looking at, um, up into quarters, so during the period April to June 2020, that was obviously when we had the first lockdown, when we did have quite a high proportion of FCC staff were either self isolating or shielding. Um, and we had an increase in waste tonnages. Um, so we did not, um, there were no deductions for that first quarter of um, between April and June 2020. We
we also waived applying any deductions during October to December 2020 and that's usual in contracts after a major service change because there were round changes in October 2020. There were deductions applied for the period July to September 2020 um, and deductions applied for the period January to March 2021. Um, so the total deductions for the financial year that we are considering 2021 total um, just under 54,000. Um, now you won't see those as an actual line in the account. Um, where they would be shown um, is, is on page 32 of the accounts or 44 of the agenda, which shows our income and expenditure um, statement. And they would obviously be in the net cost of services. So what would happen is those deductions would reduce the expenditure in the waste service cost um, and then that would be shown in your, in your net cost of services. But the net cost of services are, are not split out service by service. They, they are shown for the council services as a whole. Okay, so that's um, FCC penalty. Yes, penalty. yes. Correct. Um, and, and your second question um, around um, staffing. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. That was that was a council minute on the 17th of June. Um, I think it was council minute 3121 where the, count, the, the minute does say the council ensures that it is reimbursed for staff and on cost um, that uh, the council is currently incurring in supporting FCC in the delivery of its waste and recycling contract. So you're right, that, that is a council minute um, and that is something that is being put into practice. So that's June 2021, so we have that's one June line to the current year. So that will be in the 21. Which is before they implemented it. New system which only came in in April or whatever. So I think yeah. that, you know, we need to be corrected by that because you know we don't want to start rewriting history. Um, they've been a disaster right from the start. Um, uh, the other thing is that um, I, I do think that it's important that somewhere members of the public are able to extrapolate those figures about what what's exactly going on with the ins and outs in respect of um, uh, FCC. Uh, I don't know, if, you know, this, you know, I don't know how whether they should be in the accounts or if it should come as a separate separate item to a separate um, uh, council. Because I, I mean, the other thing that, that I'm struggling with is that we see here that there's been an overspend because we didn't introduce the new Devon Line services. We were told that in order to introduce the Devon Line services, it was going to cost us more to introduce it. We didn't introduce it, and that's cost us even more. So it seems a bit odd because we were told if you introduce it, you're going to have to have more lorries and more rounds and everything like that, and it's going to cost more, the cumulative effect will be more. They didn't introduce that, and yet somehow that still cost us more. Um, which, 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 you know, the, I appreciate the accounts are just numbers and, and in a way they shouldn't, but I, the narrative doesn't tell us that other than to say that it's cost us more. And I think that there is a, uh, a, a gap there in an explanation as to why we are where we are and what is the financial position and how do we get there rather than just headline figures 230,000 or whatever, 265, thank you. Overspend that sort of thing. Well, yeah. um, Julie's got a point that it's not um, a separate line in the account, but I take it uh, Mr. White will be able to include that in the minutes that it was, and that would make it public then. Would you be happy with that? Yeah, no, I, I am happy with that. I, but I, you know, I don't think it should be that we raise it as, a, as an item here at an audit committee when we're looking at signing off the account. And I'm sure the numbers all back up and are all correct. But what I'm saying is, is there doesn't seem to be clarity that members of the public, or indeed members of this council, can find that figure. We've got that figure because we've had to ask for it. And I don't think we should have to ask for it. Well, maybe next year. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, the, there is a report on the waste contract, which is on the executive forward plan uh, for, for the meeting on the 16th of September. 
So there is a, a separate report on the waste contract um, and that will give further detail on any financial figures relating to the contract. So Excellent. that figure of 54,000 for deductions in um, the last financial year will be part of that report as will any deductions which have happened in 21-22. Um, so we can get certainly the intention is that I've seen a draft of that report. Those, those figures are in that, that public report that will be coming to the executive on the 16th, which is sort of two weeks' time. Isn't it? I suppose the other thing is that members are not happy on the 16th with all the detail. They could always ask the executive to refer it back to the audit committee at a later date and get the detail. Um, I mean, if, if it was necessary, if you see when you do get the figures on the 16th, and if it's not dealt with an executive and you know, there's not the full disclosure there, you could potentially request that the executive get the information to send to the audit committee in the future. Should you want to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions from members of the audit committee on the whole report? Going through it. Um, yes. Just one quick question I want to ask, and that is the the 120, 112,000 surplus, mm -hmm. uh, and that's been transferred into the general reserve yeah. by the amount. Is, is that a decision that the council has already taken? No, um, no. That, that's just what happens in accounting practice. Okay. So, so that would happen in every council. Yeah, okay. yeah so it's not a, a decision that we can decide to do or not do. That's how it works. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that because I mean, members know that I've never been happy that we're taking it out of the earmark reserves when I don't think you know, it should be in yeah. general reserve. And so, what's happened is we've taken it out of the earmark reserve, got a surplus, and then so all in a way, you've transferred it from the earmark reserve into the general reserve. Well, we I, mean, it's not, I, know, I know it hasn't happened, but I mean, we can, set an amended budget yeah, in the middle no, no, of the year. No, I, 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 I accept that, but what I'm saying is. is but in the end, you've got an earmark reserve which is lower because we took money out, and then we've got general reserves higher because we understand. So, you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do, I do yeah, what you mean. Yes, yes, yes. Because we, we, we made a prediction part way through the year um, of what our losses from the from COVID were going to be. Um, and yes, I think because of the government support that we've had in and also the self fees and charges income compensation scheme has significantly helped us. So that has meant that yes, we are able to report a surplus for 202021. Um, and I think that's that's shown that so the variations are shown on page nine of the account for page twenty-one of the agenda, and that goes through um, the items. Um, and members will be able to compare that to the last budget monitoring report, which you would have had at the executive, which reported very similar figures. Yeah, I mean, having spent the bank holiday going through the whole report, um, <laughs> page 21 is one of the one of the key pages where you indicate main variants, yeah. um, which is of some interest there and, and really shows where, where it comes from, isn't it? And, yeah, how we to get that, which is basically the grant that was provided to us by the government. Okay. Yeah, so we had um, not only the, the four tranches of, of COVID funding, which um, as, as page 21 shows, that did come to 1.1 million, but on top of that, we did claim just over a million in the sales season and charges, and, and that was mainly for things like car parking income, planning income, loss of um, income from the Dartmouth Lower Ferry. Um, so that income compensation scheme was was also um, uh, very helpful to us in our in our financial um, in our finances. We will have that income compensation again um, scheme again, but only for the first three months of this financial year, so 21, 22. Um, so I have a few questions. Um, the first one is page 36, which is the balance scorecard. Our financials are showing as amber, which is narrowly off target, which is down to the council tax. Yes. Um, is there any particular reason for that? Why Why is that not addressed in the risks? On the, on the next yeah, so um, in terms of, um, if, if I take council tax first, um, our council tax collection rate for 2021, the last financial year, was actually 97.81. 
Um, and the national average has now been published. So the national average was 95.7. Um, so we, our collection rate for council tax for the last financial year was actually 2.1% above the national average. Um, so in, in, I think the reason it's amber is obviously we would have set our target for uh, council tax collection and, and non-domestic rates collection um, in advance of the year. So those targets would have been set around February 2020. That was obviously before the start of the pandemic. Um, so again, the performance um, balance scorecard is, is measuring us against the target that was set. Um, obviously, there are good reasons why we haven't met that target. Um, but if you compare us against the position nationally, um, I, I think, you know, accounts tax collection rate of 97.8% is a good as part of our performance reporting. Um, page 39, there was a concern number on that which is relating to the leisure centres where it says uh, memberships were taken by overall numbers is about 56 percent um and it also says the swimming school is performing very well with only 71 percent but of course that i would take it is because this is up until the end of march yeah so yeah. those are actually figures just the way the first month when the leisure centers were open when do we get an update on those numbers is that coming before the executive later on this month as well um so that's on the executive forward plan uh, for october so there will be a report on ledger um uh, presented to the executive in october that will obviously go into um participation rates um since the centers have been reopened and fusion will do that on a center by center basis so members will be able to look at that um, and see the, the pattern of customers um, returning to use the leisure centres. Um, and obviously we're very hopeful that during the summer periods that um, that that's been a, a, a very attractive um, uh, place for families and, um, and, and customers to, to go to during the summer holidays. Is there any short term funding requirement as a result of the leisure centres at the moment? Um, not at the moment. I mean, the, these accounts will show the um, 434,000 that members approved um, as additional funding for the leisure centres in 2021. Um, and that money was taken out of the amount reverse. That was a one-off um, element. Um, the report that will come to members in October will set out the position for this financial year, for 21 22 um, but we're not anticipating that there will be that we that members will be asked to put any additional funding into the leisure centres. Not, not at this stage, no. I mean, obviously, we can't anticipate whether there will be further lockdowns or what will happen with the pandemic. But um, what what members did agree to was the lottery funding which we received, which was around 180,000. That was passported over to Fusion. Um, and that was money to help them um, during their help them open up um, from April onwards. Um, so that was a report that went to council um, end of March. So that money has been transported across, but that was national funding. The lockdown, what it's saying is we might be asking more money from the future I, I really couldn't say at the moment. Um, it, it would totally depend on what, what the sort of situation is. I mean, the costs come from having fixed costs that you have to operate um, and, and not having any income stream from that. So um, hopefully with the vaccination programme being very successful, we are, I think we're all hoping that, you know, we wouldn't see that in, in future months. But, you know, we are approaching the winter, so we can't, um, we can't really second guess what um, page 91, it lists the salaries of all the different heads uh, of different departments and so on. Um, I was a bit surprised to see that they published the salaries of people like a head of human resources and a head of IT and so on. Um, do we actually need to do that? Is that a necessity? I understand the chief executive, we have to publish you know, certain people like head of finance, chief executive and so on, but do we need, there seems to be an awful lot of people on this list at the moment of salaries. Yes, um, it, it is a statutory requirement set out in the Code of Practice that we have to publish 
um, any employees whose salary plus expenses and plus pension contributions is it is over fifty thousand. So fifty thousand is the cutoff. Um, so all of the figures that all of the posts that you see here will be over the fifty thousand value. Um, and yes, uh, that we have to do that by law, and it's part of the accounting code of practice. <laughs> How long was that set at fifty thousand? Um, oh, it's been fifty thousand probably for at least the last five years, um, and, it, and it doesn't seem to get increased. So, yeah. consequently, our table gets longer and longer each year as obviously pay inflation um, catches up, and, and that fifty thousand limit has not been increased for a number of years now. Certainly, when you add expenses and pension contributions, yeah, quite a lot will be quite creeping over that threshold. Yes, and that's then we right. are effectively making public people's salaries. Yeah. Know, it's a public document, so we're making public their salaries. That's so right. Oh, it's really it, necessary for that, but there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, uh, this is an area that is audited, so what the auditors will do is, is take a, um, a document off our payroll system and do their own checks to make sure that everyone over 50,000 is disclosed in that note. And um, we do send that note round to all of our FLT and ELT, so we make member staff aware that their salary is going to be published um, before we put it in a public document. Okay, uh, I have a question on page 155 um, where it says, as part of our policy, we do a staff survey. Um, but I've been on the council now more than two years and I haven't seen it. So is, um, it done, is it done? What are the outcomes? Yes, yeah, we, we do do one annually, um, a staff survey. Uh, the last one we did was actually was around sort of March time, March this year. Um, so we've done that survey now for the past five years. Um, and the reason for that is, is, is to understand staff views. Um, so each year there is a, a subgroup of both the senior leadership team and the extended leadership team who go through and, and set the questions that we would like to ask in as part of that staff survey. Um, and also when we get the feedback from staff, we do develop an action plan of what's come out of, of the staff survey. So we have, last year we did change the focus of that because of the pandemic. So we included questions um, around how are staff finding the shift from working, working working from home um, and did our employees feel supported in that new way of working. Um, the majority of, of responses felt that the both the senior leadership team and the extended leadership team were communicating with them well and making effective decisions. I think staff felt that they had adapted well to working from home um, and they felt that managers ensured that they've got the right equipment um, and there was a, a very positive response about people feeling supported by their managers and that teams were managing to stay connected, even though it was obviously most of the time online. Um, so, so team meetings are still happening, even though they're online um, and teams are still getting together, albeit not, albeit virtually. Um, but yes, that, that, that is um, a very good point. I think in the past we have conclude, we have put the results of the staff survey in the members' bulletin, um, so we'll make sure that we do that. But those, those were the main messages, I think, from the last staff survey that we carried out. So it's good news? Yes, it is good news. Do members yes. need, to, need to see? That's the question. Um, I think it would be very helpful. And certainly in the past, I think we have included the results in like the members' bulletin. Um, yeah. Okay. Which leads us on to the start of the award ceremony. Um, and again, I've never seen one in the last yeah. two years. <laughs> that's due to extraordinary circumstances, isn't it? Yes, and, we, and we, we did hold them annually. Um, and the way it used to work was um, it, it was in our um, impact behaviours. So if you felt somebody was communicating well or they, they had adapted well to their work environment or a particular um, difficult situation, you actually nominated your team colleague for an award. So it wasn't managers or SLTs that were deciding um, who was put up for award. It was um, nominations from your colleagues. Um, and yes, I think the last one we held was probably about two years ago now, before the pandemic. 
Um, and we used to have a team award as well. Um, so I can remember that the elections team won that team of the team of the year award one particular year. Um, as did the revenues and benefits team, um, because in that particular year we had really good feedback from our auditors about uh, the quality of of work in our housing benefit assessment. Um, and that was a report that actually came to the audit committee. So yes, those have taken place. Um, but but not for a while because of the pandemic. Just went off the radar as a result of everything else. Um, I think because at the minute staff aren't in the building um, predominantly, um, if you do want to come in, you book a desk and if it's for a particular meeting, um, yeah, I think it's just something obviously that with the pandemic, um, haven't, we, we haven't sort of progressed yet. So if you look at the power that we sent out, um, Mr. White slightly earlier on, um, just before the meeting, and you look at page seven of the PowerPoint, you'll see that there's a recommendation there for the committee to consider um, the second part of the recommendation is regarding these awards, which is given that uh, we'd like to introduce it. So it was... um, yes, sorry, I'm just trying to find the um actual recommendation which I'm sure I have got somewhere. Um, well, I can read it out anyway. G yeah, thank the, you. <laughs> given that staff award ceremony hasn't taken place since the COVID pandemic, the audit committee recommends that the senior leadership team organise and plan staff awards events to highlight the importance of role officers have played in supporting our community through the COVID-19 pandemic, ideally to be held this side of Christmas. Um, the reason for this is basically in these accounts, it says we do it, we haven't done it because of pandemic, we've been on pandemic, so it's been missed for a year or so. And basically what we're suggesting as an audit committee is that if we've got it in the accounts, it says we do it, but we don't, it would be a good idea for us to hold a uh, staff award ceremony and um, run it, you know, prior to Christmas. Um, do members have any questions on that recommendation? Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm concerned about this because I think pandemic hasn't finished yet, right. and not only have officers, um, members of staff had a pretty difficult time during the last 18 months, but I think us as members have too. And very often I felt that we've been doing a lot of turning and throwing, and probably quite not trying to answer questions that members of staff maybe should be answering, but they've been too busy doing other things, dealing with of the work that's come through during the pandemic. So I'm not sure we would interfere. So we we have to do it for that reason. Otherwise I don't think it's the right time to actually do it. Because we don't know how long it's going on. What are the awards? Are they monetary? You know what what are we talking about? Um, um they are monetary. Um I think the awards were like twenty twenty five pound voucher um for um they were based on the impact behaviour. So it was if you were communicative, um, if you adapted well, um so we had categories. Um so for example, if it was the community um category, um there would be a first place, second place and third place. Um and, and people nominated their colleagues. Um, and then the nominations were all voted for, and if you were in those top three, then yes, it was a £25 um, voucher. Yes. Because actually, nobody's actually worked together. They haven't been in the building for a very long time, and they've probably been getting on with what's been thrown at them, but not necessarily with the rest of the officers and members of staff. And, well, what's £25? Don't you can't even only buy a bar snack in a I don't know about that, can it? We are the awards, Councillor. Oh, we've got 25 pounds of Dublin and London. Okay, yeah. Councillor Spencer. Just, just agree with you on, on a number of points there. I mean, is this awards ceremony, uh, or the award itself, meant to incentivise staff? Um, because if it is, 25 pounds doesn't incentivise many people to do much. Um, to put it bluntly, and so maybe it should be a lot higher. But is the idea to incentivise um, 
start then. I, I think the idea is, is more to recognise publicly, um, you know, um, amongst amongst the whole staffing base, um, you know, uh, people that have gone above and beyond and, you know, done an excellent job, really. Um, and I think what was nice about the awards and what the staff really valued is that it, what, that it was their colleagues nominating them. It, it wasn't coming from their manager or from a member of SLT. It was, it was their colleagues that they sat with or had dealings with um, that were nominating them. So the fact that staff voted for each other I think was um, really well valued um, and I think you know the the actual event itself was you know always um, very uplifting really if, I can only probably speak from my own experience that you did sort of celebrate you know each other's achievements and um, so yes I, th I think it certainly um, was good for staff morale yeah. And, and the other point that, that was mentioned was um, members and there's no member input to this um, and I thought we were supposed to be working as a team and to cement that team relationship. Shouldn't there be some member input? Both ones, maybe? Maybe there should be a member award ceremony, you know, yeah. um, who knows? But um, but to cement that relationship, you know, I would suggest that there was member input. Yeah, we can, uh, uh, yeah, we can certainly accept it, yes, yeah. Um, so we could, yeah. we could potentially add uh, a sentence at the end that says we member input um, and to address the issue that Council Rose raised which is 25 quid is nothing um, yes Council Rose suggest maybe something like six months membership to one of the leisure centres or something like that if I don't know if that's the sort of thing or a spa day something like that would be much better than 25 quid <laughs> I think that's an insult for us all you could give them an FCC voucher for collection of waste. The recommendation says that we recommend that the senior leadership team organise and plan a staff awards event. I think if Mr. Buckle takes away the view, we would like to see that sort of provide some benefits to staff that are actually worth having. Um, such as six months membership to a leisure centre, okay. um, more than twenty-five pounds in voucher, or maybe even the giddy heights of having your bin picked up. Um, you know, we we could perhaps leave it to the senior leadership team to sort of take that forward. We could take the board committee's feedback yes. that we would like to see it worthwhile. Effectively. Exactly. So. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so with the amendment to the recommendation, which is to add the words with member input at the end of the paragraph, effectively. So it now reads at the end, ideally to be held this side of Christmas with member input. Um, I want to propose a recommendation. Do I have a second now? Yes. Yeah, second with Councillor uh, Spencer. And um, I move to the vote. Was there any other discussion anyone would like to have on Any other points anyone would like to make? Oh, no, I, I, I'd just like to uh, say that I agree with it. Um, that, that, that this, the start of morale is an important thing, and not really the monetary value, it's just having your colleagues say you, you did a good job, and uh, that's basically what it's all about. Mm. And this is why you've got the amendment, which is with member in the yeah. chat. So on that basis, all those in favour of the recommendation? That's unanimous. Thank you, members. Thank you, members. Um, so, are there any other questions regarding the um, draft statement of the council, draft annual government statement that's been put for the audit committee? Yes, Councillor. Yeah. Um, it's just a couple of things that uh, I, I spotted. That nothing of um, nothing numeric. Uh, on page twenty-eight, um, a bit about um, the change. Okay. Uh, it says uh, in uh, paragraph 43 um, to enable our communities to implement projects supporting our new zero ambitions. I think what it means would net zero ambitions. Uh, it's a little broadly said, but I'll Yeah, sorry, that, that looks like a typo. I'll, I'll change okay. that to net. Thank um, you. The, the other thing is in, on page 98, uh, it makes uh, the reference to 
related related persons or, or phrases. Um, Would that be related party? Related, related party, party yeah. that we've had and with this makes reference to that, but it doesn't list any anywhere other than members and executive government. Yeah. Now, I would have thought, yeah, uh, mentioned them again, but FCC and now that, that the contract that we have, which is a fairly onerous contract, and uh, which we are struggling to deal with, um, they clearly do have the uh, influence over how the, the, um, the council operates and how it's making its decisions because of the nature of the contract. Why are they not listed as a related party? Um, yes, I can answer that. So related party, no, um, mainly relates to individuals. So it, we are... Is this individuals or organisations? Um, so individuals have to disclose within that related party note whether they have any relationship at, as such with um, entities that the council may be dealing with or certainly are contractors. So, for example, um, if I had a family member that was um, working or, or part of um, a, a company that the council was contracting with, I would need to disclose that in my related party disclosure form. Um, and then that would have to be disclosed as part of the council's public accounts. So the reason we haven't gotten anything in there is because nobody personally has uh, a real, uh, um, anything that they need to disclose. It would be the same as um, members disclosing when when you are elected, you disclose any um, members' interest, don't you? In, and there's a register of members' interest. So annually, we have to ask all of the senior leadership team and all of the extended leadership team if they've got any related party um, uh, transactions or interests that have to be disclosed in the accounts. So that's what that section of the accounts um, okay. uh, is, is asking. So it's, it's not the hard. Yes, yes, it's not asking us to list um, companies that the that the council um, has as it, it, its contractors. It's more um, if if there's anything that um, if individuals have anything they they have to disclose. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions from members regarding draft statement in the book? Just a clarification, really. I mean, it might sound stupid, but you said. The business rates were 90 plus percent. Yes, that. yes. Now, so where, not, does, where does a business rate relief come into that? Do we, do we actually give that, or is that given by government? Or? Um, yes, so that the, um, there are lots of different rate, business rate relief. So there are the normal ones, for example, um, small business rate relief. <laughs> Um, and that that is just applied nationally, so we don't have any discretion over that. If, if a certain business meets the criteria for small business rate relief, it's automatically applied by our software, um, the, the Northgate software that we have. We do get compensated for that. And um, so in the collection fund in the account, um, business rates um, start off with their gross amount, and then if if um, companies and businesses are eligible for things like small business rate relief, as are places like village halls, um, then that would come off as, as a deduction. Um, but we are reimbursed for some of those reliefs from government. Um, there are, so there is um, a business rate relief panel of members um, that does meet, I think, on a quarterly basis. So, for example, if a company were to come to us and apply for, um, for example, like hardship relief, that those are both, they have to meet quite strict criteria to be eligible for that. But if we were to have an application for, for that, that then is considered by the business rate relief panel um, because it not only impacts on us, it impacts on Devon County mm. and the business rate pool um, if any, any business rate reliefs are awarded. And then there are national rate reliefs as well. So um, as, we, as the pandemic hit in March 2020, the government um, gave 100% rate relief to all of the retail, hospitality, and leisure industry. Um, so there was, um, so when we sent our bills out, we had to say actually those bills will all be um, set to zero because you're, the government nationally have said that 
all businesses in those sectors will get 100% rate relief for this financial year. Um, so those figures come in by your shortfall? Um, sorry? For your shortfall, because you said you got 92 or 93%. Yeah, yeah. So you got 7%, and that is, is that business rate? Related? Yeah. That's, so, that's, all, that's all I'm asking. Yeah, 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 no, it's a really good question. So that 91.74 will be of um, net collectible rates. It won't be the gross rate. So the rate relief will come off that before we calculate that 91.74. So it's only 91.74 of business rates, which is collectible. Um, and the relief is deducted before we calculate the collectible amount. So in fact, all of those all of those businesses that were in the retail, hospitality and leisure sector, those all came out of our calculations. Um, because if we'd have included them, it would have just been 100% collected yeah, yeah. because we've got 100% rate relief from yeah. them. So you said collectible. Yeah. So does that mean everybody paid? Um, it, it would mean that um, there would be just over 8.2% that didn't pay. Yeah, okay. Um, but, but some of those would be in our arrears and we would be there would be a payment plan in okay. the future for those. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Okay. Any other questions regarding glass slate and accounts? No, I think I, I, what I would say really is that it hasn't been extraordinary. You are going to set a glass state and accounts to come from extraordinary yeah. Given you end that year with relatively sound financial situation. If you wind the clock back to the beginning of that year and you think about what we were facing, um, I think we, we'd be quite happy to be in that financial position come where we are now, really looking at it. And I think your summary is about on page 18, where you say the position that is secure with a degree of resilience is, is accurate as it stands at the moment. That's where we stand as a council, which is yeah. a positive thing given what we've been through, really. Yeah. Um, so, if there are no other questions from members, the recommendations of the audit committee notes of the draft statement accounts and the draft annual government statement for the financial year and the 31st of March 2021. Um, all those in favour? Uh, do you know that? Yes. 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 Yes.